The Beginner's Guide might be one of the most brilliant games ever made, for a reason that I don't even know was intended. Simply put, The Beginner's Guide is subversive in a way that isn't often seen in video games. I know I've already made a very lengthy video discussing this game in detail, but I wanted to make a follow-up because I've recently started to ponder the game's existence not so much in terms of meaning or message, but in terms of impact. The game was kind of a quiet blip in the larger scheme of things, but the discussion it sparked was a lot bigger, and that discussion is what I'd like to talk about. My videos tend to focus on meaning, and I think meaning is important to discuss when talking about art, but I also think that one of art's best qualities is its ability to disrupt the world around it in some way, including sparking useful discussions about what the meaning of any particular piece of art implies towards the world around it. This is the framing that conversations about the beginner's guide often had, but it still felt slightly off to me. Most game critics seemed to think the beginner's guide was about them, but I wanted to offer an alternative. That the beginner's guide is not necessarily a message towards game critics, but hypothetically a message towards the gaming community. I say hypothetical because it's really hard to pinpoint what the beginner's guide is attempting to say. You see, the beginner's guide is postmodern art. Postmodern art is art that sends its message through context, specifically the context of its existence as a piece of art. The work of art itself is the message, rather than the content that is contained inside of the art. In this sense, understanding a message requires understanding the context surrounding it. A great example of postmodern gaming that serves as an important comparison point is Spec Ops The Line. The content of the game is a military shooter, and the most surface level interpretation of the game is that it's anti-war. However, that's an interpretation that lacks context. The context of Spec Ops is its existence as a military shooter. It's not just a commentary on war, but also a commentary on other military shooters. If you've played a lot of military shooters, you'll recognize the tropes and how they're subverted to send a message, and the message of the game will become much more apparent. This is an excellent example of how postmodern art can send a message through the context surrounding it. The Beginner's Guide is much harder to discern in terms of context, which is why I want to make it clear that postmodern art's strongest quality is not necessarily its meaning, but its impact. This is why postmodern art is more about context than content, because postmodern art is more about impacting the culture and the art world through being deliberately disruptive to the conversation that we have on art and on culture. This is what the Beginner's Guide did. However, I want to add to the conversation by discussing the way in which the Beginner's Guide parallels and serves as a nice lesson to gaming culture, and in particular, the mindset that gamers have. There's been a long debate among art critics and fans of video games as to whether or not video games are art. Roger Ebert famously said that video games are not art, but this is more of a question of elitism than actual definition. Video games are art, and they're art regardless of whether or not they hold any deeper meanings or values. However, the reason why this debate happened is because video games have, historically, very frequently focused on being enjoyable and fun, rather than on meaning anything in particular. The thematic points of gaming have often been an afterthought. Escapism has mostly been the top priority in game developers and, indeed, in game fans at large, throughout gaming's history. There have always been exceptions, but this tends to be the norm. Games exist to be fun, not to mean anything. This mindset has consequences in that, while it may initially reflect the desire of gamers to recede into escapism, it also in a sense influences that desire. That desire is not devoid of implications, and the conversation about the implications of escapism is indicative of exactly where game culture is at right now. The quick rundown is that, since about the 90s through to around 2007 or 2008, gaming has been a self-contained niche subculture that has been largely related to what you could call nerd culture. This culture has been predominantly male-centric, and so games have often catered to men under the assumption that women weren't an expected audience to have. There have been exceptions to this, but for the most part, a good chunk of successful popular games during this time were catering to men. Around 2008, independent game developers started to see more success and more mainstream recognition, at which point games that filled niche desires became much more common, including a lot more games made by women, about women, and for women. Games that approach topics beyond just escapism have become much more regular and much more acknowledged by the community, and we've seen a sharp change in the way the gaming scene operates rates in the past 10 years or so, especially with the internet giving people more of a platform to engage in the community and to promote games that might have otherwise gone unnoticed.
Women were always involved with gaming, but maintained a degree of relative invisibility within the community. And this has started to not be the case as much as it used to be. With this boom in attention towards games, and more demographics being acknowledged, there's also been more of a critical eye brought into the escapist fantasies that have become so commonplace in games. This is where we see things such as feminist critiques of video games that examine problematic aspects of video game portrayals of women. The thing is, the mindset of escapism is based around getting away from the problems of the real world, and this brings with it a mindset that escapism simply shouldn't be tampered with. Having to acknowledge that you as an individual participate in a form of escapism that has real world implications, implications that might not be as positive as you think, is a bit scary. Because escapism is specifically an attempt to get away from the real world. And so a lot of people will have the first instinct of trying to preserve the escapist fantasy by simply writing off people who attempt to critique the games that they hold dear. This wouldn't be so bad if it were just a few isolated incidents, but it's a trend. And it's a trend that has reached nasty extremes, which we saw with the Gamergate fiasco. Gamergate was a deliberate attempt to try to silence any potential opposition to the escapist fantasy. It was a hell of a lot more than that, but one major component was that a lot of gamers simply didn't want to believe that their hobby was problematic, or even that it could be problematic. This led to an outright demonization of any critical look at gamers, games, or the culture of gaming. This was a very loud fight against the inevitable. Games have a platform now that isn't going away, and with it, the increased exposure and increased opportunities for alternative viewpoints means that there will be increased conversations about how games affect those who play them. Escapism on its own isn't bad, but it can be taken too far. That's one common thread between the Beginner's Guide and gaming culture. The Beginner's Guide definitely feels like a response to something. It's too upfront with being meta to not be a response. Most people seem to think that the running thread of the Beginner's Guide was game critics, that the game was a response to game critics trying to project themselves onto a game in order to interpret it, but I don't think that's a complete picture. The Beginner's Guide isn't about interpretation, it's about escapism. Escapism is essentially external validation. It's a way of looking outside yourself for catharsis or understanding, to feel good through using something else as a vessel for your own desires or insecurities. Indiana Jones is strong, therefore you, the audience member, can feel strong through immersing yourself in his life. This has its place, but like I said, it can also be taken too far. If you know about Davy Reedon, the man behind the Beginner's Guide, he had posted about suffering from depression after the release of his previous game, The Stanley Parable. The Stanley Parable had gotten excellent reviews and would end up on a lot of lists of Game of the Year in 2013. This had ended up fueling a post he made where he discussed how he sought validation through people giving his game good reviews, and that this constant need for validation had pushed him to the point of depression. What's important to note about this post is that he doesn't condemn fans or critics or people who praised his game, or even people who said negative things about his game. Instead, he focuses on himself throughout the post. A lot of people believe this post was an indication of what inspired the Beginner's Guide. That the Beginner's Guide was a response to his feelings of depression because of how game fans and critics were projecting themselves onto his game. Regardless, the post reflects an introspective side to Davy, and what makes the Beginner's Guide so important to games is that the game is, in essence, about introspection. If we view escapism as being a search for external validation and catharsis, then by contrast, introspection could be seen as a search for internal validation and catharsis through understanding oneself better, rather than through getting away from oneself. This dichotomy of escapism versus introspection is, I think, the running theme of the Beginner's Guide, whether that was the intention or not. In fact, this is an important theme because it ties together the in-game narrative, the meta-commentary, and the postmodern context for the game. The game is about a fictional Davy Reedon discussing the work of a different game developer, the also fictional Coda. The game presents itself as almost a documentary, complete with Davy Reedon's commentary of Coda's games and what these games tell us about Coda as a person. Of course, all of this is fictional and scripted by actual Davy Reedon, but it's presented as though it were real for the most part. The game is a genuinely charming experience up until the later parts of the game, where we start to see that Coda's games take a darker turn, and Davy continues to shirk off those darker aspects until it all coalesces in a very dark twist ending, where it's revealed that Davy Reedon was altering the games that Coda made in order to suit the meaning that he thought the games were trying to convey. 
Coda's relationship with Davy falls apart at the end, and Coda cuts Davy off for good. Feeling that Davy is a toxic person whose need for validation from Coda's games has made Davy impossible to maintain a relationship with. Davy then has a mental breakdown and is left to pick up the pieces and make sense of his life after realizing that he had lost something really special to him because of his own actions. That's the plot of the game. And most people interpreted the game as though it were about Davy's interpretations of Coda's games, but I wanted to offer the alternative, that it's really about Davy's escapism through looking for meaning in Coda's games. The issue wasn't interpretation, but pushing all of his issues onto Coda and Coda's work through that need for external validation. Davy was trying to escape his own problems by believing that Coda's games validated everything about who he was, so that way he wouldn't need to look inside of himself and figure out what wasn't working. This is where the dichotomy of escapism versus introspection comes from. The unwillingness to confront oneself fuels a lack of introspection, and it also fuels escapism. Escapism can work in moderation, but it should not be seen as a constant source of catharsis. This same thread runs through Davy's post about his depression, in which he discussed his need for validation through Game of the Year posts and through critical acclaim, comparing it to the sort of adrenaline rush that can come about through energy drinks. The way he described the excitement of receiving critical acclaim reminds me a lot of the way in which many gamers describe the excitement of playing video games they enjoy and getting really immersed in them. In both cases, it's an external source of catharsis, but in both cases, it can be taken too far. The Beginner's Guide came out almost two years after that post from Davey, and came out about a year after the Gamergate movement first blew up. I know that Davey Reed and himself has spoken out against Gamergate, but I can't say that Gamergate necessarily inspired the Beginner's Guide, or that the Beginner's Guide was a response to Gamergate. Regardless, the Beginner's Guide has a theme that reflects one of the major issues underlying Gamergate and underlying game culture in general the unwillingness towards introspection. This is the message that I think was missed with the Beginner's Guide. This is also where we find what makes the game so devastatingly relevant and so subversive. The game is not anti-escapism or even anti-interpretation. It's pro-introspection, and it does this by intentionally provoking it in its audience. The context for the Beginner's Guide is a culture of games that, almost at all costs, tries to evade introspection. The game's theme is one of provoking introspection. In this case, Coda's games were the art that provoked fictional Davy to search inside himself. After all, Coda keeps trying to send messages to Davy via his games, and Davy keeps refusing to look at himself through the games, but instead is constantly looking to Coda to validate Davy by allowing Davy to ignore himself. This all culminates in the moment at which Coda makes a game specifically for Davy to look at himself instead of constantly seek escapism. This slap to the face and the fallout of their relationship causes Davy to lose his mind. This is the kind of relationship that is very common in the good guy mentality that fuels a constant need for escapism. People want to believe that they are good, that they are not the problem, and we've seen that this is especially true of gamers who have, at large, become viciously critical of people who try to provoke introspection and who threaten to even imply that they might not be as good as they think. What happens is, when someone is unable to look inside themselves, and constantly needs others to validate them so that they don't have to look inside themselves, toxic elements of their personalities go unacknowledged, and no effort is made to treat people better. This is why fictional Davies' relationship fell apart, and this is why a lot of relationships fall apart. When we don't seek to improve ourselves, we risk continuing to stress out the people around us. Introspection is a necessary tool for healthy relationships, and a constant need for external validation can get in the way of this. What makes the Beginner's Guide so brilliant is not the moment when Davy realizes that he's lost Coda for good. It's the epilogue, when Davy reflects on what he did wrong and tries to make sense of who he should be. That's the moment of introspection, only when escapism becomes essentially impossible for him. The narrative itself and the meta-commentary naturally provoke introspection in the audience, and I've known quite a number of people who think of this game as one of the better games they've played, especially because of what they saw in themselves after playing it. The thing is, gamers are a group that are particularly not used to introspection, or even to be provoked into it. When a feminist media critic calls out issues of the portrayal of women in games, it's very easy to dismiss, because the message is very literal and not very emotional. It doesn't provoke introspection, it just encourages it. By contrast, the beginner's guide basically tricks players into getting swept up in the narrative long enough for the game to pull a 180 and make it very much about the audience.
Certainly, people who aren't very introspective to begin with aren't necessarily going to make a major change in mentality on the basis of one game, but if there's any way to get through to people like this, it's the way the beginner's guide did it. The kinds of people who desperately want to avoid a conversation about what games can and should be, and what they can and should portray, are people who genuinely do have enthusiasm for games. Oftentimes, these people go to games for escapism from the problems they have in their own lives. They're also often men. In a sense, they are very much like the fictional Davy that we see in the Beginner's Guide. The game does a very good job of generating empathy for the character through his likable passion for games and his insight into games, and then the game betrays that empathy to make a larger point, which I interpret as being about the perils of unmoderated escapism. This means that, in an almost satire-like way, the game provokes anger in the player that may initially be directed at the character of the game, but that also can provoke the player towards introspection that they weren't expecting to have. This is what makes the game so powerful, that it can use the medium of games not to say something, but to convince the audience to feel something. Something that the typical audience member might not feel or might not even want to feel, but also a feeling that the typical audience member might need to feel from time to time. It uses the typically escapist medium to undo the problematic aspects of escapism through demonstration rather than through preaching. The game teaches people how to pay attention to be more mindful of themselves and others, and this is a very important disruption of the cultural norm which strongly discourages mindfulness and instead encourages an almost addictive form of escapism that brings with it a lot of toxic elements that seep into the culture. To put it simply, the beginner's guide doesn't tell you to look inside yourself, it just shows you why you should. Thanks for watching.